also please keep her in prayer. And I got her the scriptures this week, and I should have been for last week, week before, but I do apologize to Sister Molly for doing that. So if there's any limitations, it's not on her. It's uh, I sent her the scriptures a little late. Amen. Hallelujah. She's going to be teaching on Proverbs like I started with you our last uh, youth service, and we're going to try to cover Proverbs for the young people because of what we laid out the first time. And I think it's a good thing to do, study on a Proverbs, the book of Proverbs for our youth. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to go into um, our Torah portion tonight. And this uh, is not really for the young at heart to hear too much of, but we're going to have to cover some of it anyway. The very first part of it, uh, I think uh, Brother Logan covered uh, the last Torah portion, and he, uh, I think Brother Jordan had said that he never heard that that uh, that Balaam led the children of Israel into spiritual adultery, and, and that is true. He didn't curse the people of God. He couldn't curse them, but he did tell Balak how to get them cursed. He told Balak, Balak the secret sauce on how to get the people of God cursed by God himself. And that, isn't that uh, really the way the enemy really works? Amen? He doesn't he can curse and spit out all kinds of blasphemies and all kinds of accusations all day long. But if you're living right and if you're under the blood right. and you're walking a Holy Ghost filled right. life, yeah. he can't touch that. Right. He couldn't touch Job. He can't touch us. Right. But if we just say, I want to err a little bit and we go right. astray, mm. next thing we know, we're not being cursed by Satan. We're being cursed by God. And that's always a bad thing. Bad yes. So here, this door portion starts out at verse 10, I do believe. And, uh, and it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel. And this is Numbers chapter 25, verse 10. Sorry. And that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Praise God. Do not consume them in my jealousy. Now, what took place here? So, if you look right above there, uh, there was a guy who brought a woman, a Midianite woman. In verse 6, it says, Behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. In the sight of Moses. Now, this wasn't Mr. Wright bringing Mrs. Wright to meet the fan. This was not what this was about. Because a lot of people think, well, it was, what's wrong with a Midianite woman? Why would you kill her? Just, that's, that's, that's ethnic cleansing. God isn't so unjust like that. But this Midianite woman wasn't just some ordinary Midianite woman who was a God-fearer, or even a common Midianite woman who didn't worship Baal Peor. She was someone that was deep into Baal worship, Baal Peor. In fact, if you read on, and it says, it says this. Okay, the context, remember that Moses and the people of God are weeping before the Lord because of the plague that happened, that broke out because they were invited for sacrifices to the gods of Baal Peor. Right? And they bowed down to their gods, so Israel yoked himself to Baal Peor. And the Lord, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the chief uh, chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun. Let them hang there for a while. This is all about sun worship anyway. Baal Peor is a is uh, not just about sun worship, it was more uh, fertility rites that does tie into sun god worship. But if you look there, it says that if you go on down and see what has just taken place, the chiefs of Israel just hung high. Hung high. And then Mr. Wright comes driving through town with Mrs. Wright right before the congregation's eyes. Now, they didn't go into the church. They wasn't heading the church. They were heading to his house. And they were going to go, and they were going to be bad people. Bad people. Bad people. So, if you read this, in the sight of 
the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Verse 7, when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, saw, uh, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber. This wasn't, this was the chamber. Do I need to be more specific? This was not the living room. This was a secret place. This was more probably a bedroom. And pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Now, thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. What was probably taking place is ritualistic activity. Fertility worship. I'm trying to be as delicate as I can without being too descriptive. What took place was most likely he was not just bringing Mrs. Wright home. He was bringing an object for other men to also partake of. He brought her in before all of Israel, before the entire congregation. Phineas, who was the son of Aaron, who was once the priest before he died. Phineas saw it, and he got anger, a jealousy, to start to cook inside. What took place was this. God had already told Moses, go hang the chiefs. What they did, uh, what they did at, at Shiloh is, we're going to punish them now. God was jealous. He was burning with anger. He was enraged by their type of activity that he was ready to destroy as many people as possible. So Phineas, being sensitive to the heart of God. Now, this, like I said, many night woman, it's not about me and night and all this stuff. It's about what they were partaking of. It's about their religion and their faith of, of Baal pure worship. And so Phineas, being sensitive to God, moved with godly fear, and he speared them both with one thrust. They must have been walking in line or standing close together or use your imagination. It was not a good situation. But because God was so angry and Phineas was sensitive to God's jealousy that he moved with action and took them both out. See, God was going to do that exact same thing, but probably to everyone else that was just as guilty in their heart. But Phineas moved and he speared them and killed them and God then blessed Phineas. So he, here we are again back in our portion. It says, it says here uh, in verse 10, uh, verse 11, it says, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. He turned the wrath from who? The people of Israel. Not just the two men. Not just the man and the woman. It gives their names down there in the center. But against the people of Israel. One thing's for certain, when we start patting uh, Baal worship on the back and say, you know, it's, it's all right. I know it's not what it means to you. I know it's got all these bad negative connotations, but we're just going to be okay with it. No, we're not going to bow down to it. We're not, gonna, we're not going to sing to it. We're not going to partake of it. Because we've got to be moved with the same amount of jealousy for the things of God that Phineas would move. Are we supposed to be a nation of priests or not? Yeah. we got to have a jealousy for the ways of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Verse 12, therefore, behold, I give to him my covenant of shalom, or covenant of peace. And it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood. 
because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. And it says the name of the slain man of Israel who was killed with a Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Bill, the daughter of Zur, who was the tribal head of a father's house in Midian. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and strike them down. Why? For they harassed you with their wives, with which they beguiled you in the manner in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief Midian, their sister, who was killed on the day of the plague on account of Peor. So you get a picture here of this is if this was a crime scene investigation unit, you the, the reason for this situation, there was not murder taking place, there was punishment, capital punishment for sin against God. God was going to do it. Phineas just carried it out quicker. Now, we also understand that sin is death, right? It may be delayed right now. It was delayed then. But in some cases, when sin is not dealt with immediately, the scripture says this. It, it, it says that when, whenever justice isn't, justice isn't carried out swiftly, it's polluted. People's heart began to get more gross and more... Uh, bold in their activity. I remember, you know, you you all grew up in school, right? Most of you did, except for my kids. They're homeschooled. But in public school, you, you get a substitute teacher. You know what you're going to do? Test it. And test the waters. Everybody's popping that bubble gum, <laughs> sucking on those uh, lifesavers, or, or leaning back in a chair, or talking, or passing notes, doing anything you can to test the limits. But as soon as you get called out in the hall, or get a demerit, what they call back in those days, back in ancient history, or you get a good old-fashioned pattern across the backside, then you realize this teacher ain't going to stop. They're going to hammer me every time I open my mouth, or every time I pass my note, or every time I blow a bubble. They're going to get me. Well, see, that's exactly the way God works in, in this case. Especially, the scripture deals with it like this. If you sin openly, you'll be rebuked openly. Mm -hmm. If you sin in privately, God will deal with you in private. You know what I'm saying? He will. But if you do it for all the world to see and then snub your nose at God and snub your nose at the people of God, he's going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. He will. We're also to have mercy. We're supposed to have grace. But when people begin to live a life of gross gross sin. Arrogantly, we are to rebuke that openly. Amen. That's what the scripture talks about. Amen. That's a, that's a part that's uncomfortable for everyone. Now, it's interesting here because verse chapter 26, it goes into a census. God tells Moses and Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, take a census, verse 2, census of all the congregation of the people of Israel from 20 years old and upward. By their father's houses, all in Israel who are able to go to war. And Moses and Eliezer the priest spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Take a census of the people from 20 years old and upward, as the Lord commanded Moses, the people of Israel, who came out of the land of Egypt, where Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, I'm not going to go through reading all, all of these. They're going to call a census, which is kind of ironic, because how many people just go, got wiped out. 24,000 just got wiped out. Not long before that, how many others just got wiped out? Not long before that, how many others just got wiped out? The people are absolutely foolish. They slow at heart. After God opened up the mouth of the earth and swallowed those folks up, right thing there, I'd say anybody that does anything against this covenant that we made with our God that led us out of Egypt, you ought to deal with me. <laughs> We're going to take this outside the tent. And we're, going to just, we're just going to wax bells above on you. I'm just going to break bad on you. You're going to wish you just had God to deal 
deal with, but I'm going to get ugly, ugly. Why? I don't want to see nobody die. I don't want to see my family die. I don't want to see no, my, none of my neighbors die. Amen. So immediately, God calls a census, and why? He's going to divvy out the promised land by the numbers, okay? By the biggest tribes get the most land. Smallest tribes get the least amount of land. He's giving them an inheritance of the promised land. The ones that died worshiping all the other false gods, all the other false things, and all the other followed the false leaders, they're not numbered in the number. They're not counted amongst the number. And it's not interesting to note as you read through, you can see it very obviously. Judah had 76,500 people, men, from 20 and up. They were the largest one. Large one, which is kind of interesting to me. Now later on, uh, you can read, and I'm just kind of pointing this this out and kind of just doing a review because we get into numbers and start reading all this stuff. There will have to be a loop of God to wake you up and sleep. I mean, Come on, it's <laughs> see, she just said that. You know, she's like, she's almost out. A few more minutes, I could. She's gonna be snoring. So. Here we go. If you cover all the way down, you come on down, and it talks about uh, the tribes and all that stuff. In chapter 27, uh, it gives another interesting story here. It says, Then drew near the daughters of Zelopheth, the son of Heper, son of Gilead, son of Nikar, Nikir, son of Manasseh, from the clans of of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. The names of his daughters were Mala, Noah, that was interesting, Mahavra, Hagra, okay. Noka, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eliezer the priest and before the chiefs and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. Now watch this. Stop right there. Don't read these verses. Our father died in the wilderness. Now immediately, your mind is going to be thinking of what did he die of? Did he die in one of his rebellions? Did he die at the waters of Merida? Did he die at the trial of Peor? What did he die of, pray tell? Because it's interesting because of this. If daddy died of that kind of curse, Daughters are not far from the tree. And they may have the same kind of mess up in their mind and up in their spirit that killed daddy. But this is what they said. He was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died for his own sin. And he had no son. So they were very honest in this. He had nothing to do with all those uprisings or rebellion of Korah. He died for his own thing. But we need inheritance. They have no debt. All sons, uh, all daughters, no debt, no, no sons, no men. And this, this is what God does then. God gives them an inheritance. And that's why I say if you do something in private, God will take care of you in private. If you do something publicly for all the world to see, you're going to get rebuked publicly for all the world to see. That's just how it works. God deals to the forward he is for. But he gives more grace to the humble. If someone sins in secret or sins in private or whatever, however it is that's on their own head, they will pay for it. God is not winking at sin. They will pay for it. But there's another thing altogether. When you stand up and lead other people in the right. way of sin, then there's no, there's no, it's, it's pretty rough. It, God gets pretty angry in this situation. In fact, we, we can talk about that later, but in uh, Deuteronomy 29, it talks about the root of bitterness. And a lot of people have asked before, actually they have told me before, you've got a root of bitterness. I've got a root of bitterness. How do you know I've got a root of bitterness? Well, they think because I've got ill will but against someone that I've got a root of bitterness. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not harboring anger at them. 
I just don't forget what they did because they never really repented of it. But I, I forgive them. But God files these things away in my mind because I'm not going to let this stuff happen again. You're the same way. God's the same way. So here, here's the root of bitterness. The root of bitterness is someone who puts an example before you that causes you to reap bitter fruit. That's what a root of bitterness is. It's not the, uh, it's not an emotion inside of you. It's an action that you're doing that God sees, and the fruit of that action will be bitter. Trust me, it's going to be bitter, especially if it's leading someone astray. Now, God says, when you see that root of bitterness, remove them from you. Get them out. Now, God deals stronger with people who are modeling themselves or becoming a model for people or trying to lead people or be that imprint for people. At that point in time, God, he holds you accountable for that. Yeah, yeah. The scripture says that when you put a millstone around, uh, actually, when you, if you, oh my goodness. What, what was it? If you fit one of the little ones, that's right. It's better for you to put a millstone right in it and be drowned in the sea, cast in the sea, than for you to fit one of these little ones. Because if you are that example and the little ones see you and follow after you, boom, you're causing them to fall and you're being bold. The blind leaders of the blind, the scripture calls them. That kind of stuff is, is, is scary. So down in verse 12, and that's the whole reason why I wanted to point this out, is because God deals with, with the daughters of Zelophead differently than what he dealt with some of the other people. He gave them an inheritance. Well, their dad sinned. He did sin, but he did sin in the same way of Korah, of all the other men. He didn't sin like that. He sinned differently. Now, um, verse 12, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Go up into this mountain of Abraham and see the land that I have given to the people of Israel. When you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. Um, so, Moses, if you can think about this for a second, Moses going up this mountain, and God telling Moses, Moses, this is going to be the last thing you see. This is it. You're going to look at the promised land, and you're going to die. I don't know if I can look. I'm going to say, God, I'm going to see it by faith. I believe you. <laughs> well, God already saw it. So I'm going to No. No. He says, see the land that I've given to the people of Israel, and when you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was, because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of sin. When the congregation <coughs> world failed to uphold me as holy at the waters before their eyes, these are the waters of Meribah, of Kadesh, and the wilderness of Zin. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation. What was Moses' biggest concern? His biggest concern wasn't, I'm going to die. I'm about to die. That he didn't even, his first words out of his mouth, God, give me a successor for the people of Israel. And watch this. This is appoint a man over the congregation, verse 17, who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. That's a shepherd's heart. That's a shepherd's heart. That they will be sheep without, that they will not be sheep without a shepherd. It's amazing to me how many people, I had this discussion just last week, how many pastors that have no no offspring, nobody to turn to? And guys, this is a real concern of mine. I pray for this. I pray for this often. I've said this before. The, the, the health of the church is not gauged in how many people you bring in. The health of the church is gauged, and not always, but it, it can be gauged, especially in Pentecostal churches, on how much ministry are you raising up underneath you. 
if you don't have anybody underneath you that you're raising up to lead this thing forward into greater territory, into greater greater futures, into greater things, then right. what have you done? Uh, really, what have you done? Um, and I'm not speaking ill of anyone, but I have seen churches like that. And, and Brother Lowe and I have had this conversation multiple times. I've seen He's seen churches like that that are just dying. There's nobody taking the reins. Nobody wants it. It's dying. And in fact, we can get statistical here if we needed to, because statistics do prove that uh, the churches are aging. People in the church are not young. They're growing over and over. There's nothing young coming in. In a lot of churches. Uh, by the year, I think, 2050, there, right now there's a church on every corner, but most of those churches are going to be converted into warehouses, business offices, and everything else in about 34 years. Because they're already suffering yeah. significantly. Yeah. What, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to handle this? God didn't call me to build a building. That's right. God called me to build a congregation of disciples. Our take on this is not the way the world takes on this. Our take is not to drive revenue. That's not our take. Our take is not to put present business reports to the uh, council of elders so they can gauge my income and, and gauge all these other things. My, my aim is not, my objective is not to create a business model. Now, there are churches that this is a complete thriving business. We can sit down in just a few moments and write out a, just a quick little snippet of what some churches do with their money, and you would be blown absolutely away in how much money comes into churches. You would be. What are they doing with it? That's the thing. Are they doing it justly? And that's fine. If you're paying your pastor full time to be a pastor, that's all fine and good. However, if he is just preaching for money, and not for change, wow. and not for repentance, and not to see God do something in people's yeah, lives, that he is called a hireling. Yeah. And it's not up to God to appoint that to, to a church. It's up to that church to call on God until he puts the right pastor in that pulpit. And, and that's the thing. Amen. That's scary. It's very scary. Moses' biggest fear was people not having a shepherd. The people of God not having a shepherd. You see the promised land, Moses, I see the promise, but they're going to need somebody to lead them into it. One thing's for certain, we all can see a promised land, but we need a leader that's going to lead us into it. Most of the time. Why is it? It's because... Here's how it would work. Everybody would spot their little piece of the promised land and say, that's mine. That's mine. Or that's mine. And there's going to be a mad rush to those little hot spots. And then there's going to be infighting. And, well, that's my people. What are you going to sit on my people? I don't want to sit there. Yeah. That's the church without a pastor. That's how it works all the time. I've been told before if you're sitting in my seat. Excuse me. I'll just leave you. <laughs> I've never said that, but that's what I thought. Okay. Interesting. Interesting thought process there. What are you going to do when I give up the seat? Are you just going to sit on it like you always do and never do anything to, for the kingdom of God? That's what I should have said. I didn't know that at all. I kept my trap shut. Because they were people with no shepherd anyway. They were people with no shepherd anyway. They couldn't be hurt. The shepherd's voice could not be heard. Mm -hmm. we we got to understand, a lot of times, Moses has already laid down some law already. The Ten Commandments being the first thing. And in that, God lays down the first four commandments is centered around him. And the worship of him only. And the people could hear that. Guess who spoke those words first? God did. Guess who heard those words first? The people at the base of the mountain. And it scared them so bad. They said, Moses, you go talk to them. We can't talk to them. Yeah. That scares us. 
And so that's what Moses did. Moses began to be a mediator between the two. But nothing could change their heart either. They were going to do what they were going to do, regardless if Moses said different or otherwise. So God had to start hammering with punishment. He had to. It's almost like a, a stupid child whenever uh, you tell them to clean your room, clean your room, clean your room five, six, seven times, and next thing you know, I'm going to clean your room. But in the process of cleaning your room, there's going to be an attitude cleaning up too. Because when I get done with you, your attitude's going to be spotless. That's how it would work. Because if you're a stiff neck, that's exactly how God is going to work. He's going to look at you and say, look, you're stiff neck, <coughs> you're stubborn, you don't want nothing to do with the way I want to do things, so I'm going to punish you. That's why we learn obedience to the things we suffer. That is the truth. Spare the rods for the child. That's exactly the way God sees us. If he spares his punishment, he's going to spoil us. And how many people are spoiled now because of grace? That's the truth. God's uh, grace is so abundant and so precious. But those who are in love with him are going to use it. They're going to use it when they need it. And we need a lot of it. But we're not abusing it. We do not need it. would you need a pastor or a shepherd in your life is because the wiles of this world, you need a watchman. God told Moses about Midianites. He said, go and strike them down and harass them because they harassed you with their wiles and their and they beguiled you just like Eve. Remember Eve was beguiled in the garden. She was deceived. The wiliness, wild, wild E. Coyote, genius at law. That's exactly how Satan is. But we get beguiled through his wiles, the wiles of the devil. What is that? His, he's cunning. Yeah. He's crafty. Very crafty. He, got, he has a lot of tricks up, up, up his sleeves. Up his sleeves. <laughs> he's got a lot of ways to spin things to where you can justify it and feel okay. He's got that. Come on. Oh, you need to be just, You want to justify what kind of sin today? Mm -hmm. Satan will help you craft that justification up mm -hmm. with expert precision. Yeah. Next thing you know, you'll be practicing that sin with, with perfection, yeah. with justification in your heart, thinking that God is okay. Mm -hmm. And God is okay. Mm -hmm. we we got to be careful with those things. And that's why God gives you yeah. another voice of. And it should be an objective voice, a voice that isn't afraid to uh, stand in your path and say, wait, that's a wild. That's the wild of the enemy is slipped into your mind and poised in your thinking. Now, nowadays, people don't like to be corrected. I understand. I get it. However, if you don't like to be corrected, then you may not have a shepherd or a voice that can speak into your life in a way that helps you look at things a little different or look at things from a different perspective or, or, or approach things with a little more um, uh, wisdom. With it. And it doesn't mean the pastor or the shepherd is always perfect. Moses wasn't. It doesn't mean that the pastor or the shepherd, and I'm not likening myself to Moses at all. I'm just saying as an office of a shepherd, they have a voice. And can their voice be heard? Can that voice be heard? I'll be preaching next weekend in Indiana, and the Lord laid on my heart about two weeks ago, developing an authentic apostolic voice. How, how do you develop an authentic apostolic voice? Well, it's sing, of course. That's what apostolic is, right? It's all about sing. No, no, it's a it's a voice of truth. It's a voice of. of being in love with the word of God. And this is the type of voice that I'm talking about now. Verse 18, verse 18 says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and all the congregation. Well, did that help? Yes, it did help. For a while. 
Joshua, which is the same name as our Savior in Hebrew. Joshua did lead the people through great victories. Joshua was the man of the hour. He was raised up. If there was ever a leader raised up to take the reins and to do what God told him to do, Joshua was one of them. Moses probably was one of the greatest leaders of all time in the fact that he could hear from God and speak to God like nobody else. He was close to God. But Joshua came in, and Joshua was a man of action and a man of war. He was a decisive individual. Moses was a little bit not as decisive. And so of us. In my opinion, Joshua probably would have said, if God, you said speak to the rock, I'm speaking to the rock. I don't care what anybody said. In my opinion, Joshua was probably more John Wayne-ish than Moses. He met Clint Eastwood than Moses. If, if you ever had a Hollywood personality that you want to pin to it, that's just the way I see Joshua. I'm not trying to make him out to be a man of the world, but I'm trying to make him out to be a man of commitment, a man of steadfastness, and a man of faithfulness. Joshua was a pretty unique individual. A character study of him would turn up really great nuggets about his life. Well, the next chapter, I'm not going to deal with this chapter completely, but it talks about the offerings, daily offerings, Sabbath offerings, monthly offerings, Passover offerings, uh, Feast of Weeks offerings, Feast of Trumpets offerings, Day of Atonement offerings, Feast of Booth offerings. And it's funny, at the Feast of Booth offerings, if you ever want to get into this stuff, I don't want to get into it right now in too much depth because I'm already being threatened to fall asleep on so I understand the threat is real. Everybody's going to start their Shabbat early. At least their snoozing part, their resting part. If you notice about the Feast of Booths, it's kind of like a countdown. It starts here on the first day, on the fourth, let's see, Verse 14, and their grain offerings of fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah. This is chapter 29, verse 14. For each of the 13 bulls, 13 bulls were going to be offered that day. Verse 17, on the second day, 12 bulls. Verse 20, on the third day, 11 bulls. Verse 23, on the fourth day, 10 bulls. 26, on the fifth day, 9 bulls. 29 on the sixth day, eight bulls. 32 on the seventh day, seven bulls. God is counting that. That's, so, a lot, that's a lot of bulls. That's a lot of bulls. <laughs> a whole lot of bulls. He but he counts down from 13 and he stops at seven. Seven bulls on the seventh day Amen. of the feast. Isn't that big? There's something to that. I just don't know what. God's got something wrapped up in that. We just don't have all the knowledge. Uh, one of these days we'll realize, wait, huh? wow. At that, at that day, that Feast of Tabernacles, we're going to say, get it. Get it. I understand this now. And if I'm not mistaken, that's including all the daily and sabbatical <coughs> offerings. Mm -hmm. So, if, for instance, if that seventh day fell on a Sabbath, all your Sabbath offerings yeah. and all those offerings as well. Sure enough. That's exactly right. That's what it says. And it's it's pretty. That's a lot of food. It's a lot of blood. A lot of blood. A whole lot of blood. Now, it's interesting to note that it, this core portion covers a lot of ground here. But I want to go back and I want to focus and just <coughs> on the half core portion brings a little more clarity here. Uh, I want to focus on the shepherd's voice a little bit more, if I can. Because <coughs> Jeremiah, if you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah was a young man. He was a young man who was called by God. Verse 4, he was called. He was called during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah, which was a great time to be a prophet. I was talking to Brother Reuben, Brother Reuben, Brother 
up his brought this up before this congregation. He was on the he was trying it on multiple occasions and again last weekend. And I like this. Uh, David had a man of God in his life. Who was it? Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet said, Thou art the man. And what happened to David? David fell off the throne and left in the throne. Mm-hmm. Josiah had a man of God in his life. There were others that had a man of God in their life, but they were rebellious. They did this thing. Saul. Saul. He rebelled against God. Okay. Who? Who? Jeroboam. Jude. Ahab is one that is very prophet, a very powerful prophet in Ahab's life, but Ahab wasn't here. Guess what king did not have a prophet? Now, I'm sure there's a few of them, but there's one very significant king that didn't have a prophet, didn't have a voice of God. That's Saul. Hmm? Saul. He did not have a prophet in his life that prophesied to him or corrected him in his life. What happened to Solomon was is he ran into major problems with him. He was led astray. He had so many wives of different faiths, of different nationalities, of different things that led him into further idolatry. Solomon was a great king, he was a wise man, but he allowed things to taint his wisdom. He didn't have a prophetic voice in his life. Some will say, well, Solomon was a prophet. It could have been, but Solomon, you can't be a voice to your own self. you got to have a voice outside that's going to be able to speak to you. Speak to you. Now, it has not taken me years. I have, uh, I have wanted, as a, as a pastor, I was always under Pastor Mary Rose before we went into the Sabbath. And when we went into the Sabbath, I usually counseled with several pastors. And I would tell them what I was dealing with and what I was going through, and they would correct me, or they would tell me. I had some of them tell me flat out, you're wrong. And that was fine. I already had copies of one of them. He told me, he said, you were wrong, brother. You do not behave like that. I'm sorry. I will will take that. I will try to remember that today. And so I've had other pastors tell me that I submitted myself to and talked to them. I've tried to stay submitted to leadership as a pastor. And now I'm I'm submitted to the leadership of Bishop White and, uh, and the CACI, the Council of Bishops. That's all fine and good. That's wonderful. I need a voice in my life. Not a, not a voice that's going to be timid with me, but a voice that can speak to me with clarity. A voice that can speak to me with reason. A voice that can speak to me with anointing. A voice that can speak to me with love. That's the same thing that you've got to have as well. Jeremiah, God called Jeremiah as a youth during the time of a great king, Josiah. During the time of great revival. But God started showing Jeremiah that there was trouble ahead. This is how he called Jeremiah. He said, verse 5, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And and Jeremiah's response was, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares Jehovah. Then Jehovah put out his hand and touched my mouth. And Jehovah said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The calling of God on on Jeremiah was kingdom builder or kingdom destroyer. Think about this for a second. If the people of God could have heard the voice of Jeremiah, it would have been building a kingdom. Even in the midst of great chaos, Jeremiah could have prophesied their way to victory. Think about 
about it for a second. If they would have just stayed submitted to the voice of the Lord and away from all the pagan junk and submitted to the thoughts and commandments of God, they would not have been destroyed by the nations around them. They would have destroyed the nations around them. Jeremiah, if they would have just turned to God and said, God, forgive us, with bitter sorrow and repentance, and then told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, we will hear what thus says the word of the Lord prophesied to us, and we will obey. And you know what God would have done? He would have started prophesying through Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you say this. Come on, bring it on, Babylon. Come on, bring it on. You're going to show up one way, and you're going to flee seven. And that's actually what they're going to do. What happened? Jeremiah would have carried them to another plane, prophetically speaking, if he if they would have just listened to the voice of the prophet. They couldn't hear. Him. So God gives them the call in verse five. He gives them the confidence in verse eight. He gives them the calls in verse ten. And now he gives him the test in verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Because the same Hebrew word for almond branch also sounds like another Hebrew word that God, God doesn't work like that. Watch it. Yeah. He does a, he does a work like that. Watch it. Shate. Shate is the almond branch. And shoke is watch. That's exactly yeah, right. right. Hebrew okay. That's right. That's very good. Very good job. That's that's exactly right. So it sounds so similar that God was doing a work for him. Work he said, what do you see, Jeremiah? He says, I'm on the branch. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over you. Over my word, I'm sorry. People are Verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come. And every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls. All around and against all the cities of, of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them. For all their evil and forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods. And worshipped the works of their own hands. That's the big sense. But you, dress yourself for work. Or quit yourself like a man. Dress like a man. Arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them lest I dismay you before them. And I beheld, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. That's what it told Jeremiah. So remember Moses, when God told Moses, Moses speaking the rock, and he struck it and said, Right? God then basically tells Moses, you're not going to the prophecy. All right? Why? Because he didn't have God set apart in front of all the congregation. It's like this. If I can make this uh, plain, it's kind of like this. Ladies, have you, uh, you may have, you may not have. But I'm going to assume that if you had a, if you were dating some guy years ago, you were married, before you met your husband, you met a guy, and you like him, and he likes you. He tells you so. He says, I love you. You're my one and only. You're my set-apart one. Watch this. But then when he gets in front of his friends and all the other girls in school, he acts like he doesn't even know you. Did he keep you set-apart in the eyes of the congregation? No. What would that make happen in your heart? Jealousy would rise up. You would begin to get angry. That's exactly how God felt when Moses did not sanctify him in the sight of Israel. 
God got mad at Moses because Moses did not do what God said and keep God set apart. God told me to do this, guys. I can't help it. That's why, listen, that's why when my family tells me, come on over for Christmas uh, lunch, and I understand some people can't, don't feel like this, I get it. But for me, i got to keep God set apart. I can't say, sure, I'll, I'll come. The Lord told me no, but I'll go. And, and I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable or, or angry or anything, but when the Word of God speaks, we've got to keep God's Word and God Himself set apart. Why? He's the lover of our soul. We love Him. We don't want Him to be jealous of us. We don't want to, we don't want to go to school or go to work and say, you know what? On, on Sabbath day, man, I'm right there with everybody hallowing His name, hallowing the ways that He loves and, and blessing His name. But then when I get to work or when I get somewhere else, I don't want to keep Him set apart the eyes of the people. He gets jealous. He gets very jealous. On my laptop at work, I've got the sacred name of God right there on the, in the middle of it. Y'all know this by now. I don't go and, and proclaim what I am to anybody. I just let my life live and let people ask questions. I don't go and start preaching to them. Like, you don't do that right there. No, 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 no. I let them be who they are, and I love them right where they are. And I just say, hey, here I am, and I love you where you are, you got to love me where I am. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not perfect, but I tell you, the moment you say that I'm a preacher, they shut me down faster than anything else. But if you just put the signs up, show them the signs, and then they ask you, well, what, what kind of, what are you? Set apart in our conversation. He's got to be big enough to keep our tongue straight. He's got to be big enough to keep our mind straight. How many have failed? We all have failed. I'm not beating anybody up. I'm just telling you. We've got to learn how to keep them set apart. I remember early on when I was probably, I was 12 years old, most likely, sitting at the lunchroom table one time with a friend. Well, I thought it was a friend until that day. And he did not want to keep our friendship as a special thing. He started making fun of me in front of everybody. You go to that church and they speak in tongues, don't you? And I mean, I was embarrassed because most of the people in that in this county did not do that. They go to these other churches. You speak in tongues. You do this. You do that. You go to those holy roller churches. Why don't you speak in tongues for us now? Come on, Chad. Speak in tongues for us now. And I just dropped my head. And the Lord spoke to me. He spoke to me right there. And I never will forget it. I'm not talking about this very often, but I never will forget it. He said, now you know how I feel. And I was like, wow. Now I only had the Holy Ghost just maybe five months. A very short amount of time when that took place. And it's like, my goodness. I don't know what to do. I was a marked man at that moment. I was marked by people around me, but that was all right. They began to ridicule me, make fun of the pastor that I had, make fun of the church that I went to, but it didn't drive me away. It drove me further in. It drove me, I wanted more of it. I wanted more of what God wanted. I wanted to know more because if people can act against God like that, to me, it just testified that there was something to this thing. There was something to it. So what we gotta realize here is this. The authentic voice of God, we've got to learn how to identify and keep it set apart. Keep the ways of God set apart and holy. Now, we may do the, we, I may dance or, or, when I say this, hang on, hang on. Someone may say jump, and I say, okay, no problem. They may say, uh, come outside, I may walk outside. They may say, bow to this idol, and I'm going to say, oops. They may say, uh, go do this with us. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. You never do anything with us, do you? I have friends tell me that. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> if you want to do something with me, you got to do this, this, this. Not that, that, that. And then stop doing anything. Well, I raised part. I wanted to keep God set apart. Not that I'm perfect. God, God knows I'm not the perfect man. I have fallen many times. However, we want to attempt 
to do everything, to strive to keep him set apart. We want to hear the voice of God. We want to keep his voice crystal clear in our ear. Remember, we don't want to forget him. Now, how many, how many young, how many you ladies? Because I know how jealous ladies can be. At least my lady. No, I mean, I'm just kidding. Men can be jealous too. God is a man who's very jealous. He's very jealous. And I'll tell you, God's jealous of man too. He says, "My name is jealous." If you look up jealous in the dictionary, you're gonna see God's name. That's, that's what you're gonna see. His name is jealous. So here's something else. If you Forget something about your wife or your girlfriend when you were way back when. If she, if she told you something she liked and you forgot it, yeah, it could get a little ugly. It could get a little ugly. <laughs> Later on, that will become a boiling point. She's going to say, oh, don't you just love that color? I'll be like, no. You don't love my favorite color. So, it's funny, if she can remember things that I never, I'm like, how in the world do you remember that person? How do you remember that name? I can't, I do not know. And I can speak about things, and she's like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah. You don't remember? It happened like, zip, zip, zip. I was not even there. You're the one that said it. You're the one that said it. I don't remember. We remember different things. It's kind of weird. Remember what God wants us to remember. The nation that forgets God yeah. okay. is going to be turned into hell. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's going to turn you into hell. Ooh. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs tells. God wants us to recall, and if we say that we are in love with Him and we don't remember nothing about Him, we don't love it. If we if we say we love you and we don't remember the things that he even told us to remember. Oh man, do we really love it? So, you know, that, that's a that's a question to that you're gonna have to seek out in, in prayer. Because if you said to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and you don't remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, then you may have forgotten your date. So here it is. Divorce proceedings will be taken. Uh, there will be divorce proceedings proceeding in Jeremiah. I think it's chapter 4. But here in chapter 2, this is what God says. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord. This is what God says. I remember the devotion of your youth. Your love is a bride. How you followed me in the wilderness. I can almost hear him whispering in this. Can't you almost feel the heart of God right here? He's trying to move his bride back. He said, I remember. You remember? <laughs> the devotion of your youth. Your love is a bride. How you followed me in the wilderness. And a lamb not sown. Israel was holy. The first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares Noah. God is trying to woo his bride back. He likes when we look to him for guidance. 
We say, return to your first love. You know, you can't return to your first love if you've never repented in the first place. When you, you remember when you repented? If you haven't, then you need to. And if you, when you do, you will say, God, I love you and I will do anything you tell me to. I'm done with this. I'm done with that. I'm not going back to this. I'm not going back to that. That stuff is dead to me. I don't want nothing to do with that. You hate it, so do I. I want to love you and you love me. It was devotion to what the Father's ways. And God was wooed by that. A lot of times what happens, we lose our first love because we allow the things to creep back in that we kicked out when we first turned to. We allow it to creep right back in. Slither, really. It was a slither in that. And we allow those things to get back in our heart, to dull our ears from hearing. Do you remember whenever you first fell in love with him when the preacher would get up there and preach? And it could be one of the most boring sermons in the history of all sermons. And you're like, waiting for an opportunity to say amen. Baby breath, you're like, please. And they could be saying, Yep, Moses said, Amen! Amen! Oh, well, I just got to do that. Have you ever done this? Have you seen it? Because you were just so worked up. And there was nothing Amen about. You were Amen in any way. I've done it. I've done it. I was just worked up in the moment. Just, God, I want to. Amen! Preach! Sometimes you can try to amen a dead preacher and go live. I've tried that before too. <laughs> and some of y'all have too, just recently. Right here, right now, probably. Um, it says, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. So he wants us to be devoted to him and follow him wherever he leads. Mm-hmm. And it was in the wilderness that they fell in love with him. Supposedly, should have. That was where where it happened at in the wilderness. They fell in love with him. I think there's something to be said here because in the wilderness there are not many options. You know what I'm saying? Some some of you some of you ladies didn't have any other options because all the other guys were too 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 out there too far in the world or too crazy or too wild. So you took the best options around, right? That's what my wife did. She settled for the only option available. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But here's the thing. There were not any options in the wilderness. That's why they did not go astray as fast as they did. The moment they found other opportunities. The wilderness. No longer were, were they in exclusion to him only. They were now inclusive to others as well. And you know as well as I do, relationship is not built off of inclusiveness of others. It's built off of exclusiveness. Trust. Commitment. And those things. How you follow? Follow him in the world. God is looking at this and he's overlooking the ugly parts. Because there was some ugly things that went down in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. He's trying to woo you. Now, that was really God. Mm-hmm. I overlooked our immature lives. We made mistakes. We were just wrong. Yeah. But I love you. That's what he's trying to do. Hear the word of the Lord, verse 4, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the, the Lord. I, I, this is next week's poor portion, but I want to touch on this in thought. What wrong did your fathers find in you that they went far from you and went after worthlessness and became worthless? And that's a broken heart. God, that's a broken heart. And we want to say it's not what it means to me. How 
how many times are you going to break a heart until that heart is broken so far that they just say, okay, I'm going to do You'll find out that God will do that for a season. But then it's divorce proceeding time. And when it's divorce proceeding time, there's no help for you. Amen. What wrong did you find? Did your father's find in you? There was no wrong in him. Not at all. If these people could have heard the voice of Jeremiah, they could have fixed the problem. If those of the Old Testament saints in the wilderness would have heard the voice of Moses, they could have fixed the problem. The, the problem was their heart would not hear what God's word was trying to say. He loves us. He's insane in love. But until he, we reciprocate that, we, we say this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the word of God. That's the truth. I love it. God gave. He gave all. He didn't hold anything back. He displayed his love authentically. He displayed his love passionately. He displayed his love without apology. He hallowed you in the sight of everybody. He kept you set above. He kept you as the apple of his eye. Even when he had the opportunity to turn his back on you, he did. So we, we approach him with the same zealousness of love. And that's your first love. So Christy, and I think my wife may have mentioned this past prayer meeting night about returning to our first love. That, that, that's true. That resonates with me. That resonates in this season that we're in. It resonates in this end time hour. Because he said, when I return, will I have faith in the earth? And the love of many is going to wax cold because iniquity is going to go down. Because they won't hear. They won't hear the word. They won't hear what God has to say. And so those examples keep being set. And so people are just going to fall right in. Well, Pastor, I'm not just going to do Well, they, they preach it's okay for the Sabbath. I'm just going to break the Sabbath. They preach it's okay to, not, to keep Sunday as a Sabbath. I'm just going to keep Sunday as a Sabbath. I'm just making general observations of them, kind of keep it glib, but we got to understand. Those examples, what wane, it makes our love wane. You hang around a bunch of fanatic sports individuals, and it won't be long. You may not be a real big fan of some sports, but you hang around long enough, and they're going to drive you to be as much as a fanatic as they are. You hang around them long enough, and they will push you. And they will try to divide you up or say, what's the thing you read for? And you don't even know what reading for what is about. <laughs> but you may pick their team or a contrary team just to mess with them. But they're getting you in the game. They're getting you in the game. They say, you know, you start to learn a little bit more, a little bit more. Now you're a fanatic just like they are. It happens all the time. However, when it comes to God, we get out there in the world and we allow them to impress those things by their lives. Yeah. Not the God. Yeah. They impress those things on us. But now we feel like we are in love. We get it wrong. Yeah. Um, we, I'm closing. We have got to make sure that we keep our first love keep his voice crystal clear in our ear. How hard is that? It's very hard in this day and time. It's very hard. You deal with the world very much and it's going to start numbing you to the gospel of the voice of God. Because you don't want to keep him hallowed when you're going to kill him. 
you know, one year. That's what God told Jeremiah at the very beginning. Jeremiah, I'm going to be with you whatever you do. You say what I'm telling you to say. And it will be okay. So come to me. Can we pray for just a second? I feel a spirit of of humility, a spirit of brokenness.